All right, hello everyone. Real quick sound check. Could anyone in the chat give me a heads up that they can hear me? Awesome, cool. Thank you, and thanks for joining. Uh, so this is my very first Twitch stream, so you know, fingers crossed everything goes well. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, my name is Matt Graber. A uh, little bit about me. I've been in InfoSec for a bit over a decade now. Uh, my current job is I'm the Director of Threat Research at Red Canary. Um, and the intent behind this stream is just to talk about general InfoSec topics. Um, my areas of interest and expertise um, have fallen generally in the realm of Windows, uh, where I've done a good amount of reverse engineering, uh, a bit of work on the offensive side. But as of late, uh, pretty much all I do is defensive work, uh, which I love. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, something that's been pretty near and dear to me for a while is uh, application control solutions, particularly um, Device Guard, or at least that's what it was named initially. Uh, it's now named Windows Defender Application Control. So um, I'm going to go ahead and assume that uh, there's zero knowledge and experience with Defender Application Control. So I'm going to go at as slow of a pace as possible. Uh, but if anyone ever feels like I'm going too fast, just let me know in chat. I'm trying to keep an eye in chat. So hit me up with questions. I want this to be pretty interactive and with that, I think we'll get started. Um, another thing I'll try to do is, me being a PowerShell fanboy, um, I've just been playing with the new Windows Terminal Preview as of late, and I'm loving it. Love the color themes. I love the tabs that you can have in it. Like You can split panes and everything. So I'm starting to get into that workflow. I want to try my best to stick to everything command line, if possible, like within reason. Um, and so if, uh, if my workflow is a little slow right now, just bear with me while I try to learn all my key mappings and get familiar with that. Um, all right, so let's dive into the meat of this. Uh, actually, before doing that, uh, I do wanna give a shout out to OJ Reeves. I, I love OJ. Um, he's, we've, we've been online friends for a while, still haven't had the pleasure to meet him, but he's been doing a Twitch stream for a while. Uh, really encourage you to check his stream out. He was really the person who really helped me like pull the trigger on this and motivate me to get around to doing this. I've been wanting to do this for a while. So thank you, OJ, for uh, motivating me to, to do this. All right. Um, all right, so what is our, our objective today? Um, so we'd like to build detections for all the things, like we're never going to run out of detections to build for new and novel attack techniques. Um, but at some point, uh, I feel it is worth the effort to attempt to investigate what preventative controls are available to help us ideally mitigate or remove large classes of attack techniques. And so what I thought we could do today was uh, talk about Defender Application Control. And one of my favorite features of it is the fact that you can have separate policies for device drivers and user mode code. And to me, application control, like with, with those features, uh, like device drivers versus uh, user mode code, if you start with a driver allow list, to me, this is like application control on easy mode, right? Because if you think about it, uh, you're probably not going to have a large suite of device drivers that are constantly in flux. So obviously you're gonna need the device drivers required to get the system to boot, right? So like the, the Windows specific like inbox operating system drivers. And then any additional like hardware specific drivers, like this is obviously going to depend upon your, your physical hardware or if you're in a VM like I am, there are going to be drivers related to that. And then on top of that, 
um, any additional uh, software products that have a driver component. For example, any of the sysinternals tools uh, generally have a uh, device driver component, um, certainly like, like Sysmon does. That's how it captures most of its telemetry. Um, so we're going to want to account for these things. And so what better way to start um, building our way up to a more complex application control policy than by just focusing on drivers today. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so our strategy for today is we're going to do two things. Uh, we're going to start with a base policy. Um, now, writing application control, or uh, I'll, you'll also hear me refer to them as code integrity policies, um, are, I would say the, the crux and most difficult aspect of building these is to build them from scratch initially. Um, and certainly that's the case when needing to figure out what core components of the operating system uh, you need to let execute. Obviously, you need to let a lot of core OS components to, to run. And so we need to figure out what the best strategy is um, to allow that code, uh, that core set of code to, to execute. Now, fortunately, Microsoft provides us with some really good example policies. And we're going to pull from that uh, via the uh, Windows Schemas Code Integrity Example Policies directory. So um, we're going to parse through that. Uh, I'm going to talk through the different components of that. And we're going to strip out some of the components and use that as our base and build on top of that um, and go from there to build a, uh, in this case, a, a host specific uh, driver allow list. So what are the prerequisites for this? Um, well, we're going to be using a good amount of PowerShell, so uh, it would certainly help for you to be as familiar with PowerShell as possible. Um, I'll talk through as much of this as possible. Now, a note about Defender Application Control. Uh, currently, you can only build policies on Windows 10 Enterprise. Um, apparently, that's going to change in the future. I just heard from uh, one of the PMs uh, recently on Twitter that in the next build of Windows, um, they are removing that restriction, which is incredible. So Defender Application Control will be available to, uh, for building policy available to anyone. You've always been able to deploy policies to any Windows 10 uh, and server uh, SKU, um, but it, it's just kind of a pain to have to be forced into the, the enterprise uh, license to build this stuff. But things are changing. Um, gradual progress is good. And lastly, so I wrote a PowerShell module called WDAC Tools. Uh, it's what I use pretty heavily to automate my workflow of auditing, building, and deploying code integrity policies. Um, we're going to focus today on just the auditing piece. Uh, there's some really rich uh, event logs that are generated when you're working with code integrity. Um, and But they can be kind of a pain to work with manually. And some of the fields are not very intuitive. And so, um, and like manually going through the event log uh, via the GUI, just it, it doesn't scale. Um, and we're going to want to use some leverage automation to help us uh, build a policy as quickly as possible. So the thing that we would ideally like to prevent in our scenario here is the installation of any unwanted, suspicious, or malicious device drivers. All right, so the example that I'm going to use that we're eventually going to prevent is um, there's a driver out there. It's called uh, Read Write Everything. It's a, a software package. Uh, you can just Google that and, and find it. Um, that allows you to modify pretty much any conceivable uh, kernel structure you can think of. So this is a signed driver. Uh, anyone with elevated privileges can load it just fine. Uh, even on like the latest version of Windows 10. Um, something like that on pretty much every host you can think of, like has no legitimate use case, like certainly in an enterprise scenario. So if it doesn't have any business running in our environment, then I feel we should prevent that from 
uh, from launching in the first place. And there's like this, there's just this whole world of driver tradecraft that's possible. Like once you get execution in the kernel, there's literally nothing that you can't do in the OS. And so if we can prevent that tradecraft from occurring in the first place via code integrity, then I, I say that's, that's a solid win. All right, so without further ado, let's start diving in. So I'm gonna switch over here to PowerShell and we're gonna start by copying the example policy that I mentioned. So I'm gonna go into C windows. Oh, it's uh, C windows schemas. It's an example policies and I wanna start with a with the audit policy. So I'm just gonna copy that over to my desktop and then we can start looking at that. Um, for reference, let's look at this directory and see what's in here. So Microsoft supplies you with uh, several different policies. Uh, the ones that I really like personally, just only because I tend to or on the side of more secure are the default Windows policies. Now, um, so there's a distinction to be made between code that is Microsoft signed and Windows signed. Now they're both signed with code signing certificates issued to Microsoft, but there's a subtle distinction here and the easiest way to make that distinction in PowerShell is with the built-in command like get authentic code signature. So like if I did C Windows 32, kernel 32, and then expanded out all the properties, uh, what I'm looking for here is that um, the is OS binary property there at the bottom is set to true. That means a few things. That means that it is signed by Microsoft. And so what do we mean by signed by Microsoft? Signed by Microsoft is um, a code signing certificate. So what, sorry, what do we mean by signed by Microsoft on a very technical level? Um, it's a certificate that is signed by a chain of certificates up to a root chain. And there is a very small handful of root Microsoft certificates. And in the OS, there are APIs to identify if something is Windows signed or not. Basically, like if it is a Microsoft certificate and it chains to a, um, a Microsoft root certificate, um, which, is, um, which is whitelisted in the kernel, there's like a list of hashes uh, that's um, that's whitelisted in, in the kernel. If it matches one of those and it's a Microsoft certificate, but it's gotta be a special kind of certificate. So we're going to, I'm just gonna save this to a variable here. And we're gonna look at the certificate and the property I'm looking at here is enhanced key usage list or uh, EKU for short. If this attribute, the Windows system component verification attribute or EKU is applied to the certificate. That means that this code is intended to be inbox Windows code. And so from an application control perspective, uh, this is this to me is like a logical starting point. Um, there's lots of things that can be signed with Microsoft code signing certificates, but have no business uh, being signed with a special Windows uh, code signing certificate. So for example, an example of something that is Microsoft but not Windows signed is, um, I think I have it here, we'll do, uh, yeah, Sysmon, okay. So let's do this. Um, Get authentic code signature on that. Oh, yep. Got spaces in the path. 
Okay, and you'll see that while this is signed by Microsoft, and it's a valid signature, is OS binary is set to false, right? So this is, it's Microsoft code, but it's not Windows code. So my philosophy is, um, when I would like to allow Windows code by default, I would not like to allow Microsoft code uh, by default. So that's gonna be reflected in our policy. And again, that's what these example policies that Microsoft supplies uh, reflect. The default Windows ones only allow Windows sign code, whereas the Microsoft one allows any Microsoft sign code. So Microsoft and Windows sign code would be allowed. Of course, it's entirely up to you what your um, acceptable level of trust is. Um, again, I just wanna stick with Windows for now, okay? All right, so we have our policy that we're gonna work with. Let me fire up a new tab here. All right, here we go. Okay. So let's start at the top and work our way through this. All right, what are we looking at here? So this policy is XML. That's how all code integrity policies start in this form. And then when we're ready to deploy them, we're gonna use a commandlet to convert them to a binary form that the kernel knows how to, to parse and interpret properly. Uh, but obviously this format is slightly more human readable. Um, so let's start with these uh, rule options that they have here and walk through uh, each one. Um, or at least I'll, I'll speak to what my understanding of each one is. Okay, so first, um, so think, think of these, uh, these rules as like the global configuration. Uh, yeah. So Sonny, yeah. Question is, is this the, d the default windows audit policy? Yes, it is. Um, so think of these as like global configuration options for your code integrity policy. Um, so let's go through these. Uh, the first one enabled unsigned system integrity policy. All right. So code integrity policies can be signed. Um, this is very much recommended as a way to uh, mitigate against uh, admin attacks, right? So if you do not sign your policy and there's an attacker running elevated on your system, well, they can either modify or remove your policy. So we should absolutely be aware of these attack scenarios and have that play into what our um, our threat model is, okay? Uh, for the time being, uh, we're gonna leave this unsigned. I'm okay with this just for the purpose of this demonstration. All right, next, uh, we're definitely gonna wanna start with audit mode, this being a um, just a driver policy. If we uh, thought it would be okay to remove this it would be placed into enforcement mode and we would probably have an unbootable system. Um, I don't have enough, can, uh, enough hands with fingers to count the number of times that I've bricked my system, um, screwing this up. Uh, there are ways to recover it. Like you can, um, um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're not gonna get into that. So anyway, just be very careful with this. Um, ensure you're confident in your policy before you go placing this into audit mode. Um, here's another way you could shoot yourself in the foot by removing this. Um, so the advanced boot options menu, um, is like what you can boot into, like, uh, initiate like alternate boot sequences, initiate like troubleshooting sequences that are like, uh, like out of OS. Uh, so if <laughs> you have to be very careful if you're ever going to remove this, cause this absolutely could, um, end up breaking your system. Um, if you're not able to, uh, like out of OS, recover your policy, if you screwed it up somehow. <clears throat> so I generally always leave this on unless I'm like traveling to a very high risk area where I'm very confident in my code integrity policy. And I want, um, you know, part of my threat vector would be like physical, 
uh, physical access to my machine. Um, okay, so here's here's an important one um, that I'm actually going to remove. So enabled UMCI. This stands for user mode code integrity. I mentioned you can have policies uh, for device drivers and user mode code. Having this enabled implies that your policy covers both scenarios. So I'm going to pull that one out because we're just focusing on um, on a driver policy. All right. Um, I'm. I still remain confused uh, to this day as to what inherited default policy means. Um, yeah, so question uh, regarding why I removed UMCI. So is this because you can merge a UMCI and KMCI later? Uh, yes. Uh, what's, what's pretty cool, so uh, KMCI being kernel mode code integrity, so by removing UMCI, it's implying that our policy just applies to kernel mode <clears throat> code integrity. Um, so yeah, one of the great features, um, I think it was introduced in 1903, was you can have multiple policies uh, now. So what I've gotten in the habit of doing is I have a separate, um, I've got a separate policy for just device drivers. So like I'll have a base device driver policy and then whatever I want to supplement on top of that, say I've got like software or hardware specific drivers, I'll have a supplemental policy for just that. Um, and so that those policies will be separate from my user mode policy. And um, for me, like it just makes things much more auditable and maintainable by having completely independent kernel mode and user mode code integrity policies. So that's like a workflow that I've gotten into recently. So uh, yeah, hey, hey Jeffrey, thanks for thanks for joining. So Jeffrey, uh, for reference, is uh, one of the PMs on the Defender Application Control team. So thanks a lot for joining. Um, so inherit default policy. Now, Jeffrey, uh, you could correct me if I'm wrong here. What I have noticed is that if I remove inherit default policy, uh, then I can no longer apply my policy to non-enterprise SKUs. That has at least been my experience. So I've always left that in. So intention is that the default windows be rules become an option and your policy becomes just the rules you create. Okay, I'll have to ponder that that one a little bit, but I, I really appreciate the, the input, Jeffrey. Um, so uh, we're just gonna leave that in there and not, not touch it. Um, last one, update policy, no reboot. Um, so this one is really nice. This is a relatively recent feature. Previously, you would always have to reboot anytime you updated your policy. Um, this is no longer the case. Um, the exception being, to my knowledge, that um, upon initial, um, well, you're gonna wanna restart anyway. Like, because we're talking about a kernel mode code integrity policy in audit mode, we're gonna wanna reboot anyway and then pull the events back from the event log and get a sense of like what's actually booting like at boot time versus later on, okay? So again, uh, the only rule that I removed is the UMCI, user mode code integrity rule. All right, so moving down, um, how I'd like to do this now is actually go all the way down to the bottom of the policy. And the way that I, uh, like my workflow for parsing out these things is as follows. So I will go down to the, towards the bottom to the signing scenario section. And uh, okay, so this is, uh, this is the UMCI policy. So I don't really care about that so much. So here's the, the kernel mode code, code integrity policy. I will start here. And because we wanna make sense of like what's included in this policy, we'll work our way backwards, all right? So for example, I wanna know what these allowed signers are, what they refer to. Like, is there anything that I can remove? For example, upon initial glance, like 
does the does this test signing allow rule like actually have any business in my production policy um probably not um, but we can uh, scroll up here in a second and um and look through this all right so question uh there's a there's an option to flip from enforce to audit mode if you hit a boot failure with something yes that's actually a good call um let's flip over to back to PowerShell and the way that you can programmatically set those rule options is with the set rule option um, commandlet which sorry to sorry to mention it here Jeffrey but this is just a terrible commandlet as a as a PowerShell nerd like um, so it has a built-in dash help switch uh, which is not like the PowerShell way to do things. Like there should be built-in help so that you can just do get dash help on set rule option instead of doing this. But anyway, um, that, that'll be the end of my, my rant on that. So to, uh, <clears throat> to see what rule options are available to set programmatically, like this is how you can list them out. Um, I've also pulled up the Microsoft documentation. So here, if you search for WDAC policy rules and file rules, you can get all the relevant info here. So I think what you were uh, mentioning, um, is, is this Brian? Is that your name? Uh, who asked the question? What you were asking about was, yeah, hey, Brian. Um, Boot audit on failure. Yeah, that's actually a good call. Um, so used when the WDAC policy is in enforcement mode. Yep, when a driver fails during startup, the WDAC policy will be placed in audit mode so that windows will load. Yeah, that's a really good call. Um, that's saved my butt a few times for sure. <laughs> um, man, way to, way to throw the, the intern under the bus, Jeffrey. And you said originally, so now does like a full-time, like, are you willing to throw a full-time employee under the bus now too? <laughs> anyway, uh, so um, I think I'll, I'll hold off on on setting this uh, for now since we're, we're just going to be playing in, in audit mode for, for a little bit. <laughs> All right. I, I, I troll because I love Jeffrey. Um, okay, so let's go back to our policy and start parsing through some of these uh, these signers. Um, let, let's look at this this test signer. Um, let's scroll up a little bit and try to hunt this down. Okay, so here it is here, this test 2010. Now here's where things get a little challenging. Um, I've never really been a huge fan of this. So there's two ways to define what a signer is in your code integrity policy. You can define it using this well-known type, which Microsoft doesn't document. So this corresponds to uh, presumably some offset to an array in ci.dll probably um, to refer to like a hard-coded um, uh, certificate, or sorry, like a hard-coded uh, certificate hash um, so these are best reserved for Microsoft's use. Um, I don't recommend you screw around with these in your own policy. It's just kind of a challenge because like ideally, I would like to know what, um, what hash, like what certificate hash um, this actually refers to so that I can make a more informed decision about whether or not I want that certificate to be trusted or not. Um, but because I can't do that, I just kind of have to trust that, um, you know, uh, Microsoft is doing a good job at, um, selecting which ones are, are which, um, so, but I'm just going to roll the dice here and I'm, I'm going to remove, well, let's see. Well, let, let's just kind of browse through and just get a sense of like what else is in here. Something worth noting here is this uh, the cert EKU attribute as applied to certain signers. 
So I already mentioned previously when talking about Microsoft versus Windows signed code um, that you can have uh, enhanced key usage attributes uh, as a part of the certificate. And what's cool about EKUs is that it allows a certificate to, to uh, distinguish like what its, its actual intended purpose is. And a really awesome feature of Defender Application Control is that you can build your rules based on certain EKUs. So uh, again, going back to the Microsoft Windows analogy, um, there is little difference between a Microsoft and a Windows uh, certificate, except for that EKU, um, that Windows system component uh, EKU, uh, OID value is applied to the Windows one. Um, so that's how we can get away with this quote, Windows only policy. Um, and so once you understand that and you start like digging through and looking into what these uh, EKUs refer to, then you can really get a sense of like just how powerful some of the, um, the, the rule setting can be in Defender Application Control. <clears throat> So for example, like here's the uh, here's a rule for uh, Windows or Microsoft Store signers, um, and and here's the other um, type of uh, certificate uh, allow or like certificate rule. Um, so you have the like the well known and then TBS. TBS stands for to be signed. Um, this refers to the to be signed hash, which uh, think of it like the thumbprint. But uh, my understanding of the distinction between a certificate thumbprint and the TBS hash is that the thumbprint in the traditional sense is the SHA-1 hash of the certificate itself. Um, the TBS hash, I believe, is the hash of the certificate based upon the hashing algorithm that's specified in the certificate. Okay, so... Again, my understanding here is, let's look at Sysmon again. Um, so Sysmon, signer certificates, and I think it's hash. Uh, I forget what property it is. Uh, yeah, signature algorithm. So like if I create a rule based on this Microsoft signer, um, the TBS hash would I would expect to be a SHA-1 hash, All right? I don't, I don't see Jeffrey chiming in to uh, tell me I'm wrong, so I'm just gonna go ahead and assume I'm right there. <clears throat> All right, so again, well-known and TBS are the two um, types of um, signer types that you'd see in these signer rules, okay? And here's where the uh, enhanced key usage uh, list is. Um, so this value property corresponds to the, the OID. So this is just how um, Defender Application Control represents that OID. And I, I guess I didn't mention exactly what an OID looks like. So um, here at the bottom, like you see that value that 1.2.840, um, that, that value is an OID or an uh, object identifier. I, I believe that's what it stands for. And every um, EKU, every EKU has its own, yeah, object ID as well, all right? So again, uh, so like that 1.3.6.1 value, this is how uh, it is represented in a code integrity policy. Um, you're never going to have to write these by hand. Like we're going to use uh, commandlets to auto-generate all this stuff for you. Um, so the main purpose of me walking you through this is just to get you comfortable um, with uh, with just becoming literate in how to read these. Because you'll, you'll definitely want to avoid uh, writing these by hand if, if possible. Okay, so let's go back to the bottom. And um, I think earlier, I the only one I removed was that test signer for the 
kernel mode code integrity. So I'll just remove that, and we'll just um, we'll we'll just go with this, and uh, go from here. All right. So what we're gonna do is we're going to go over to our admin prompt here, and we're just going to issue a single commandlet, convert from CI policy. So you give it the XML file path, default windows. Oh, um, did I save it? I, I don't think I did. Um, I should probably save that. Cool. All right. And then the binary file path. So what we're going to do is we're going to just deploy this bad boy right away. Um, save it to C, Windows, System32, Code Integrity. And we need to name it SIPolicy.p7b. All right, so Sunny, question. Do you recommend removing the store EKUs in an enterprise setting? Um, my answer would be it depends. Um, I probably should have, well, if I was going to deploy my strictly KMCI policy, then yes, I would remove it. Um, I would clear out all the user mode code integrity rules. I'm not terribly concerned about that now, just for the stream, um, about tidying it up too much. Um, the important point here is that I removed the, the UMCI setting um, otherwise, if it was a um, if it was a user mode code integrity policy, absolutely, I would I would keep the store EKU in there, and I would uh, encourage as much as possible um, my IT department and users to go through the the Windows or the the Microsoft Store uh, as much as possible. All right, so one liner. Let's deploy this thing. All right, uh, we didn't get any errors. That means the XML parsed well and it deployed just fine. Now, uh, we're going to want to reboot. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to take you over to the event viewer. Um, now, we're going to be using um, a PowerShell function to go through all this. But just if you wanted to do this through the, the visual route on uh, application services logs, Microsoft Windows, code integrity, operational log. As audit and enforcement events are populated, they're all going to populate here. All right. So after our reboot, we should expect to see some uh, some events to occur. All right. So why don't we do this? Let's do it live. All right. Um, oops. All right. All right, let's see, let's see how well I've uh, rehearsed this workflow for rebooting <laughs> for the stream. It looks uh, like so far so good. Uh, while we're waiting on that reboot, any, any questions? This shouldn't take too long. Oh, it's worth mentioning too that um, by default, Defender Application Control, anytime it checks the code integrity of a PE that's being loaded and it validates it properly and that it um, is allowed per policy, it caches that validation in the form of an NTFS extended attribute. So you can invalidate, like you would have to be elevated to invalidate that caching, um, but it's, it's a really good thing that it does that just from a perf perspective because otherwise code integrity or ci.dll in the kernel would be going crazy like always validating code integrity and i think james forshaw did a blog post on that mechanism of uh 
NTFS extended attributes as they relate to Defender application control. All right, um, cool. Oh, by the way, yeah, I noticed this yesterday. Um, weird bug in Windows Terminal. So here's here's how I've been addressing this bug, and maybe someone has some insight. I fire up like standard PowerShell or command prompt, and then I bring up the Windows Terminal, and it automatically works somehow. I don't I don't get it. Um, I'll have to dig into that later. So if anyone has any advice about that. Um, that'd be cool. Uh, one of my favorite commandlets to pull up the, the event log UI, show event log. Pretty handy. Uh, Jeffrey, so confirmed with dev that inherit default policy shouldn't currently be doing anything. Okay. One day we want to make it super simple to include rules for Windows to work. Oh, that'd be cool. So like if you could just like set a switch to like not bother with a policy and just say anything that's Windows signed, go ahead and allow. Like if that's what you're talking about, like that would be, that'd be amazing. All right. So again, we go into Microsoft, Windows, code integrity, and hey, it looks like, let's see. No way. Oh, cool. Yeah, thanks for confirming, Jeffrey. So um, I'm a little surprised that we did not get any uh, code integrity events pop up. Well, let's do this. Um, here's a good test. I think I have it handy from earlier. All right. Oh yeah, um, SC is weird in PowerShell. All right, so we're still in auto mode. Um, so I was expecting this to uh, to be successful. All right, so let's go over to our policy and hey, look at this. First demo fail. All right, well, hey, we're all in this together. So let's, let's debug this together. Uh, default, cool. All right, so let's start from the top and we got rid of UMCI, all right, so I don't expect there to be any audit rules. Uh, I wonder if this could be a case of just having to reboot, uh, reboot twice maybe? Let's see, did I copy the P7B? Yeah, cool, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think we'll probably reboot again, but um, that's a good call to just, uh, oops. Just to validate that the P7B is indeed in the correct location. Uh, code integrity. Yep. Yeah. All right. So that's looking good. Um, hey, I'm not too worried. I think this is going to work out. Oh, hey man, hey Lee. Yes, good call, derp. Of course, that's why SC wasn't working because it's a default um, alias to set content. There we go. Yeah, and I, I, I never use set content, so I, I just never, I never think of that. Lee Christensen, everyone, Tipkin. Good to see you, man. Uh, There we go. Yeah, I mean, isn't this like how we learn everything just by like constant failure? 
All right. Now I expect this bug yeah, uh, to happen again. This is annoying. Maybe someone else could figure this out. It's so weird. I just wrote that function. It's part of my profile. I love it. Cause like, I, I don't like going to the UI and being like, right click launch as administrator. Ain't got time for that. All right. Um, so do show event log. Let's cross our fingers here that we have something, but Hey, if we do fail, we got Jeffrey in the room. And we can just blame him. So I'm all about that. All right, so bleh. let's try this. Uh, SC, oh sc.exe um start read write everything okay we're running my system is probably owned oh hey hey look at this we got a new event um let's refresh all right you're not fired jeffrey <clears throat> cool. Um, let's see what we got here. So we got one uh, 3076 event. Code integrity determined that system would not load rwdriver.sys, or it would have blocked it um, if this wasn't in audit mode. Um, and what's cool, uh, this is a relatively recent addition. Uh, it specifies the, the policy ID. So now that you can have multiple policies, each policy has its own unique policy ID. And so this is really helpful um, to like better triage and like scope your, uh, your events um, so that you can like quickly identify like, oh, well, what policy did this event correspond to? Um, and yeah, you can set that in set CI policy ID info. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, so let's let's dig through here and um, just walk through some of these um, properties together. So uh, you're going to get file name. So this is the thing that would have been or was blocked. And I believe it's the case with primarily device drivers that you're going to get this. Uh, what do you call this path type? This like NT path or device path. Um, anyway, um, just not you, it's not going to map to the, the actual partition. Um, so you just have to deal with that. So this is the path of what would have been blocked again. Um, and then you get the process that um, that created the event in this case because it's a device driver is the, the system process um, that started that. Uh, requested signing level and validated signing level. Um, I can't even tell you what that is. Um, I don't remember what these correspond to, but fortunately, um, well, there are blog posts on it. Alex Inescu wrote a really good one about signing levels. And I know James Porshaw has some material on the meaning of these things, but um, I've mapped them to human readable strings in the audit um, code that we're gonna look at here in, in a minute. <clears throat> um, so signing status, this is this should always be the same, just based on my experience. Um, and again, Lee Tifkin hooked me up with this. No, it's not uh, cert util. You give it any error code. What is it? Dash error. Yeah, and it will map it to the like human readable value, which is like super cool. So I've never seen it uh, anything besides this um, like error code. So 
system system integrity policy violation. So um, we've been working with a code integrity policy. Um, Microsoft's like internal name for that, or like before code integrity policies were really coded like XML configurable code integrity policies. Um, there were system integrity policies. Um, so I, I believe like from the context of the kernel, like when we're talking about a binary policy, um, that is what the kernel refers to as a system integrity policy. That's my understanding at least. So just the subtle distinction there between system and code integrity policies. All right, next um, we get hash. So this is the, um, let's see, this refers to the authenticode hash. Uh, and the flat hash refers to the file hash. What's the difference? All right, let's, let's dig into that briefly. Um, what is, I think it's, uh, SigCheck does a good job of listing these out. Dash H. Kernel 32 is like always the canonical example that I use for checking code integrity stuff. So let's look at the hashes here, of kernel 32. All right. Um, so these hashes here, MD5 and SHA-1 and SHA-256 are the file hashes. And we can validate that with the built-in get file hash commandlet. All right, and I believe the, yeah, the default algorithm is SHA-256, but you can specify alternate algorithms. So you see that match there. Um, these hashes, the PE, SHA-1, and 256 hash are the authenticode hash. So this is, think of it like a file hash of a very specific portion of the PE header, all right, um, which consists of all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my best here. Um, let's pull up. Actually, let's try to, maybe I can do this. Uh, yay, that is exactly what I wanted. So, no, no, uh, so II is an alias for invoke item which invokes the default file handler for a file. So because I've installed uh, CFF Explorer, which is a great uh, free, e, uh, free PE parsing utility, um, that's the default file association for, uh, for PEs for me. Um, so real quick and dirty way that the authenticode hash is calculated is it considers all portions of the of the PE file with a few exceptions. Uh, and my understanding, um, but don't don't trust me on this, look up the PE authenticode specification um, to get the actual details. Things that are not included as a part of the authenticode hash would include um, the checksum. Yeah, the checksum. Hey, Casey, how's it going, man? Sub T, good to see you, buddy. Uh, so the checksum, now, uh, when you have an embedded Authenticode signature in, um, in a PE file, that signature itself is not included as part of the Authenticode signature. And the way that the PE knows that the signature is included is here in the data directories section, um, you'll know that a PE file has an embedded Authenticode signature if the security directory um, relative virtual address and size are populated. Um, now this is not, this is actually not an RVA. Um, this is the only exception here. This is actually a file offset um, to the embedded Authenticode signature. So this field 
and the size field and the embedded Authenticode signature are not included in the Authenticode hash. So going back here, um, that's the distinction that's being made. All right, flat hash is the file hash and then hash, uh, as far as a code integrity policy is concerned, is the PE Authenticode hash. All right. Um, some other nice things that you get are the policy name. All right, and I don't, I don't believe I showed you this part. Oops. All right, so let me scroll down to the bottom here. Um, so here in, the, uh, in the, this settings element, you can specify a name and an ID for your policy. Um, this is really nice. Uh, so I mentioned that the policy ID, uh, which is a, a GUID value, um, is one way to uniquely identify a policy, but you can identify them in a more human readable fashion by specifying a policy name here. And so that is indeed specified in the event, as well as the policy ID. My understanding is you can set this to any string that you want as well. I've gotten in the habit of setting policy ID to the date that the, the date that I built the policy. Um, you also get the policy hash. So, so this is the file hash of the binary policy, not the XML policy. Um, and then you get this awesome P metadata. So original file name, internal name, um, this stuff, um, if you're not familiar, is pulled from the version info resource here. All right, and it, um, there's a there's a decent resource editor in CFF Explorer, so you can expand that and look at that. Um, but basically, um, what it its intent is is like when you right click on something, go to properties and go to details, that's that resource, that embedded resource being parsed out. That embedded resource is a part of the Authenticode hash, meaning if an attacker was to modify that, yeah, sure, they can modify it, but you've invalidated the signature at that point. So that's a really robust um, way to do signature validation. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel you, Jeffrey. I, I've, I've pondered the same thing about two different uh, policy idea, IDs, but I've, uh, I've come to terms with it and I, I use it for my own devices and uh, specifying the, um, the, the build date for my policies. So this is really cool. Like, I mean, I, I think of this like the, the more recent version of Sysmon that like you get this information now, only we haven't even deployed like any, um, any endpoint solution, not even like Sysmon, like this is all built in telemetry that we could get. Um, so think of this like this, like application control doesn't have to be application control. In audit mode, it is just another source of telemetry. So like you don't even have to think of this like, oh, application control is hard. Like no one's going to like me, no one's gonna like enforcing policy upon them and it's gonna be a maintenance nightmare. Like I absolutely encourage you to get to that point. Um, but as a means to supplement telemetry, like Defender Application Control is just freaking awesome in its latest state. Uh, it didn't used to include like all this uh, PE metadata, policy good and all that extra information. Um, so it's, it's, it's really moving along. I've had mixed results with the user writable uh, field, and I, I think, Brian, you've dug into this quite a bit. Um, my understanding for what user writable would be would be that this would be set to true if the PE that created an event uh, resided in a directory that um, any effectively any authenticated user had write access to. So any like non-elevated principle had write access to. Um, I've had mixed results with this. Like I've 
collected a ton of these events and grouped by user writable and that hasn't really been my experience um but i don't know maybe other people have uh different experience with this or different expectations of uh what the expectation of that user writable property um is to be but I, i'm just not confident enough just yet to rely upon that for anything meaningful all right uh the next thing so anytime a code integrity event or um, in the case of an audit event event id 3076 is raised uh, there's going to be a corresponding 3089 event uh, this is also a relative uh, recent addition. Um, this includes all the signer information, which is freaking awesome. Only um, to me, initially, when I first saw this, uh, the problem is like, well, how the heck do I like programmatically correlate the two of these events? Like, am I really going to have to like do time slicing of events to be like, um, you know, for every 3076 event, look like half a millisecond uh, into the future and then try to pull out the 3089 event? Um, no, that's not the case, fortunately. Um, let's see, so note it checks user writable at runtime. And if you as a user can change your permissions, you can make true or false. Interesting. Brian, didn't you do a write-up on this, or was am I just thinking of like an extended uh, Twitter thread that you had on this subject? Yeah, I didn't. Um, I honestly didn't pay too much attention to it at the time, only just because like it wasn't really relevant to me. I hadn't like dove uh, dived into into that feature yet, but I know you had, which was cool. Um, so anyway, going back to the the correlation piece. All right, user writable is if any SID not included in a hard-coded set of specific SIDs we consider admin that has write access to the directory. Yeah, that's my understanding of the intent behind it. All right. All right, so check this out. This is really cool. Let's expand the system properties of these events and scroll down to correlation activity ID. Did anyone ever know that this was like a thing that could be populated? So check this out, B5DD, so on and so forth, and B5DD65CD. So that is that is uh, the built-in mechanism in event logs to correlate uh, related event IDs. I just learned that recently. like. And I thought that was really cool. Um, the The sad thing, though, is that I'm not aware of any product um, outside of like just built-in OS mechanisms, like you know, get WinEvent and PowerShell to like do that correlation for you. Um, like, I, yeah, I, I just can't think of any solution that surfaces correlation ID such that you can like craft some cool queries to do that correlation. But I'm also not aware of many other events that actually employ correlation activity ID to make those um, those links. Like, uh, um, so like Mark Rosinovich when he was writing Sysmon probably could have used correlation activity ID um, instead of like relying upon like process GUID to make that correlation? I, I don't know. Um, hey, what's up, 12AP? Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, just cool thing to know. So um, now now you know that like that's a thing. All right. Uh, so there's that there's that TBS hash again. So the the publisher TBS hash is the to be signed hash of the code signing certificate itself, like the certificate that signed the code. And then the issuer TBS hash is the hash of the certificate that issued the code signing certificate. And usually with, uh, with almost all code signing certificates, there's a chain of three certificates. The actual code signing certificate, an intermediate issuer, and then a root certificate. It's generally how that works. <clears throat> All right. So let's dive back into this here. 
And um, let's look at the auditing script that, that I had. All right, so this is in um, my, w, my WDEC tools module. So here's what is exposed to you in, in this. Uh, we're just gonna play with <clears throat> um, get WDAC code integrity event. Now that's kind of a mouthful, but um, I never worry about these things in PowerShell because you have great, um, great tab completion. All right, uh, let's look at the help on this. Look at some of the properties. So you have a user kernel, uh, like filter switch, audit enforce since last policy refresh. Um, so if I specify dash user, this would say, just give me all code integrity events that are just user mode events. Same goes for a dash kernel, just KMCI, kernel mode code integrity events. Uh, I only want dash audit events, or I only want enforcement events, or I only want events that have occurred since I last refreshed my policy. Um, also by default, I don't do that uh, signer or WICL correlation. So WICL is uh, Windows Hardware Quality Labs. Uh, it's another like special kind of um, uh, signing mechanism. And there's another event that corresponds to that. Uh, because that correlation can be time consuming if you're dealing with a ton of events. Um, I just don't enable that by default. Hey, take care, Jeffrey. Thanks a lot for joining. Uh, your, your input was really, was really valuable. Um, so anyway, uh, oh, and you can also specify max events. So um, I have a tendency to like increase the size of my code integrity log. And so I usually end up with a ton of events in there. And so it, uh, it can be really fast if you specify max events to like say, just give me the last 10 events versus going parsing through like all 10,000 events or what, what have you. Um, Now, um, any, any good PowerShell function should ideally have a default case. So as you might expect, if I just hit enter with no arguments, it would return all code, all, uh, code integrity events, which I only have one. <clears throat> all right. So here's how I would parse through this. Actually, I will, um, we're here. Let, let's say I, I just want a kernel event. And I just and, and I also wanted to pull the signer information, and I'll save that to a to a variable. All right, and I still just have that one. So let's walk through this. So um, the event type is audit. So I base this on whether it's a 3076 or enforcement 3077 event. Uh, signing scenario. I map this value for you. Um, Signing scenario is somewhere, yeah. SI or um, system integrity signing scenario. Uh, my observation was that when it's kernel, it's zero. And I believe it's one when it is user mode code integrity. Of course, it isn't documented anywhere, but you know, we, we do what we can. And then the file path. And I also encode, um, do the resolution of the, the file path for you and validate that it's on disk. Um, and if it's not on disk, then you'll, you'll get a warning. It's useful for me. Like when I'm doing code integrity on installers, like it'll just throw out a ton of warnings and show me like which installer files were, were deleted. So I find that to be valuable. And here's the, um, those signing levels. So if you recall, they were, f uh, set to four before. So this is like the more readable mapping to it. So, um, it being authentic code means that it has an embedded authentic code signature, um, but that it's not Microsoft signed or it's not Windows signed. Again, I encourage you to look up um, Alex Inescu's post on signing levels. He gives some great detail on, on this, all right? Um, there's a policy name and ID and the policy GUID and the file metadata. We get that in there as well, in addition to the, um, the now correlated signer information, which is really nice. Now, uh, you can have multiple signatures on a uh, embedded within a, a file. 
And so that's what the signature index is. If there are multiple uh, signatures on a file, then uh, the signature index will um, will be updated accordingly. And signer info will return uh, an array. It always returns an array, but there will be multiple of these objects present. Okay. Cool. So um, I guess the overarching demo fail of the evening was in doing my policy, I was expecting, um, so like I, I'm in VMware Fusion, I was expecting VMware specific drivers to show up in the policy. So does anyone have any ideas on like how we could maybe get them to show up? Or you know what, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Um, let's copy. So while we have a little bit of time left here, code integrity. No, uh, we're looking for C Windows schemas and those example policies. And I'm going to copy over this uh, deny all audit. <coughs> All right, so this should be pretty short and sweet. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna deny all drivers from loading in audit mode. Um, and so because I'm talking about drivers, I'm gonna need to remove UMCI because otherwise we'll just be absolutely flooded with events if we do deny all for user mode code. Um, so let me go in and edit that. All right, and then we will uh, YOLO from here. Uh, so convert from CI policy, give it the deny, deny all audit. Um, deploy it to system 32 code integrity, SI policy. All right. start so yeah the the rationale here was um, to try to debug perhaps why I'm not seeing VMware specific drivers not loading or not having uh, audit events because like I don't expect those to be Windows signed um, I'm just gonna deny everything go through the audit list and first validate that VMware specific drivers are actually being surfaced in events. I, I have a theory on why they're not being uh, surfaced in the event log, but I'm not gonna reveal that yet. And uh, hopefully this isn't another case where I have to reboot twice. All right. You all seem very patient with me too. You're all nice. Oh, you know what? Why am I going to, like, I showed you the UI once. We don't ever need to do that again. Um, Okay, all right. What do we got here? All right, we got a crap ton of these things. So um, let's see, how can we start parsing through these? I propose that we select 
resolved file path. Just pull out the file paths to kind of get a sense of what's going on here. And then we'll sort by, okay. And just go through here and um, get a sense of what's going on. Oh, you know what? I have a, I have, I have a much better idea. Um, so we get, here, let, let's look at a few of these events. What's the first one? This is, uh, yeah, like a Windows one. All right, what do you say we group by product name as a way to uh, maybe coax VMware out of here? Yep, there we go. So I'm gonna save this to a variable again. TMP is like my canonical driver or uh, variable name that I use. Um, okay, so this first one here, let's look at that event. So VMware HGFS, okay. Here's my, let's see. What is the theory here? So what, my, my question is why do these VMware events not get surfaced? when we have a Windows only policy. Um, all right. Yeah, so that is the theory, like it is cross-signed. Hey, what's up, Andrew? Thanks for joining, man. Um, oh, so why is signer info blank? Uh, no, I don't think it was signer info that was blank. I think that was, um. That was the product name that was blank. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Sonny? Um, so going back here, uh, let's see. So what did we, what did we allow? So we allowed these things. So like Windows production. Um, and see, like, here's, here's another one of the issues, right? Like these, uh, annoying, well-known attributes is like, I don't know what, uh, certificate hash these correspond to. So like if something is, um, cross-signed by Microsoft, as is the case here, let's, um, let's, let's pull this up. Oh yeah, uh, the signer info was blank, Sonny, because I didn't specify that switch to do the signer info correlation, just in the interest of speed. But they are signed, unless unless I'm I'm missing something here. Um, so all right, VM HGFS. All right, properties, and of course I could. Do this with a. Actually, you know what? You can't do this with get authentic code signature. Get authentic code signature only returns um, a single uh, certificate. It doesn't return multiple in the case of like multiple signers. All right. So, um, so this was cross signed by Microsoft using like their Wiccle, uh cross signer cert. Okay. So the question is, could this not be surfacing because it is uh it has that wickle windows hardware quality lab cross signing certificate and yes i i agree with you lee um that would be really nice um so yeah casey does a cross signer have the eku let's look what yeah, okay, yeah, I, I think I know where you're going with that, Casey. So check the EKU at least to see if there's like a corresponding um, uh, rule that has that EKU in our policy. I like that. Um, view certificate, details. 
uh, EKU. Okay, so it would prop, let's see, Windows hardware driver extended verification. Could that be it? Um, let's go back. Let me look at the EKUs. Or perhaps, what about Wickwell? All right, so what is, uh, what has the Wickwell attribute applied, the, the, uh, the Wickwell EKU attribute applied to the rule? So we have Wickwell, SHA-2, Wickwell, SHA-1, Wickwell. So it appears to use that pretty consistently. So what do we have in the driver rule set here? Okay, all right. Cool. So, um, all right. Apologies for all my excessive scrolling here. So the Wickwell one corresponds to this 305, I think. Oh, man. Let's see here. Um... think this is a match um, crap um, so I wrote at one point and actually I think it's in here sorry bear with me here <laughs> yes <laughs> Yes, Brian, this, uh, this is a very, very accurate representation of the process that goes into this. And I intentionally did not uh, prepare this workflow in advance so that you can accurately capture what the process looks like. Because, um, I mean, what better way to learn through our failures and challenges than any other way, in my opinion. All right, so let's go to Program Files, PowerShell, Modules, WDAC Tools. I think I have an internal function here. Um, CI Policy Parser. I think I have like a helper function to parse that EKU string or that um, like OID. So let me, yep. And because this is a helper, um, it's not going to be surfaced externally in the module. So um, let me snag that one more time. Oh boy. Oh crap. <laughs> PS read line fail. What is going on? All right. All right. Oh, oh man, I really screwed something up here. Let's do this the quote right way. Schemas, code integrity. Again, you all are, are so patient and nice. Um, okay, example policies. Um, what was it? The default windows, yeah. All right. All right, so Wickwell, let's copy that.
and what did I call that function? Um, convert to OID. Oh, ew, I have to give it bytes. Okay, let's do this. Absolutely riveting. Is this not? This is computer hacking at its peak. What do you say? Do we have a match? 135, that's what we saw in the certificate. So thanks again for that suggestion, Casey. All right, that uh, this one. So we do indeed have a match. So I suspect now, um, if anyone wants to hang out just a little bit longer, we can, uh, oh wait, no, I've got, a, I got another half hour. You guys get to go through this uh, drudgery with me just a little bit longer. Um, oh, hey, hey, Jeffrey, uh, what did you miss? Oh, you missed a good time. So we were debugging those really annoying, uh, well-known uh, signer values to try to troubleshoot why VMware drivers using the stock Windows policy were not being surfaced in um, audit events as I was expecting. And um, Casey had the great suggestion to validate the EKU of one of the VMware specific drivers. Um, look at the EKU, it corresponded to uh, Wickel. Um, and because there's no easy way to um, go from like well-formed OID value to this um, like binary blob. Uh, fortunately, I had written a function to uh, do that a while ago. And so we do have a match. So uh, what we'll do again here is, uh, I, I think I screwed up that other policy. So I'm just going to copy it over again. So see uh, schemas. Uh, all right, example, we want that default audit. And we'll go to here. Okay, again, so we're starting from scratch again. This wasn't too bad though. So I'm gonna remove um, UMCI. Now those Wickwool ones are the ones that we want to get rid of. So let's go down to the CAMCI allow list and remove the three Wickwool ones. I'm sure Jeffrey, you're cringing at this, but uh, I really want to drive the point home that <laughs> I don't want any non-Windows uh, drivers to, to be audited. Because who knows when the next, uh, like, you know, VBox uh, exploit is, is going gonna, is gonna to come about. All right, so let me uh, yank those out, and we'll go with that. Oh, we should be good there. Ah, I can close this out. Oh, man. I'm like really failing on this here. Yikes. Okay, well, uh, all right, let me just confirm one more time. I'm a little, a little paranoid here. All right, did we actually remove the Wickwool signers? Yeah. Oh, no. Well, Wickwool flight signer. Uh, I won't worry about that. Um, I always remove the flight signer. So what the hell is a flight signer? Um, any uh, Windows preview code is, uh, is flight signed. Um, so because the VMware drivers are not gonna be flight signed, 
um, I would expect those, like these rules to not be relevant. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's copy. No, we're going to do convert. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, now we got to reboot. That should do it. So yeah, again, Casey, that, that was a really good idea. Um, considering we had those uh, well-known signers that we don't know the hashes to, to the way in which we debugged it was by um, matching the EKU that we saw in the VMware driver to the to the policy and there was indeed a match and so uh, hopefully now we'll <clears throat> we'll see those VMware events surface. You ever try to tab complete variables that don't yet exist? I feel like there should be a feature in PowerShell by now to like know what I actually mean. Using AI. Um, all right, kernel. All right, Let's see what we get here. VMCI, VM raw disk. Hey, look at that. All right, cool. Sweet. So we're looking good now. Uh, question: Is there easier way to then invoke sim session for applying new policy? Um, is that like without rebooting? Is that your question? Oh. Um, yeah, to my knowledge. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. So Jeffrey says, yeah, they're going to be releasing a tool that refreshes it. Um, but no, currently, the, yeah, the only way to refresh a policy without a reboot is using WMI. Um, you don't have to use invoke sim session. Like you can just call invoke sim method to do it. Um, and part of the deployment, like the building and deployment code in my W. WDAC tools module abstracts that away for you because um, I I never enjoyed uh, remembering like the exact WMI method and arguments to supply. Like no one should have to do that like on a regular basis. So yeah, that's cool to hear that there's a, a tool being released to, to do that. Um, I, I would love to see like the equivalent of like double click to refresh policy sort of thing. So um, but I mean, that's what like PowerShell functions were designed for anyway, to like abstract and automate that, that crap away. Um, so cool. Um, this, this is looking good. So, all right, now here's, here's the next step. So what I'd like to do is build a new policy based on the audit events. Now we're only dealing with nine unique events here. All right. Um, in reality, you're probably going to be dealing with more than this. So, um, fortunately for the the purpose of this stream, um, this is this is doable. Like we got this. All right. Um, and so the idea would be uh, a couple things. So we want to build a new policy that reflects the hardware or like the third party hardware or software specific drivers and either merge those into our existing policy or have a separate supplemental driver policy 
that would supplement our base like Windows driver policy. So like that base Windows driver policy, the idea being we would like rarely, if ever, need to touch that thing. Um, but then let's say as we like transition to different hardware or install um, new endpoint security solutions that have a driver component, um, we would have supplemental policies um, that would go through like change control, like in GitHub, and we can manage those a lot more easily with those supplemental policies. Um, but let's not um, get the cart ahead of the, the horse here. And let's, let's just focus on building a dedicated policy for the VMware drivers. <clears throat> So um, here's, here's one thing that we could do. Uh, one of the reasons that I uh, intentionally attempted to resolve that device path is so that we have a sane file path to work with. So these all look like VMware drivers, right? Like we, we can probably all agree on that. And these are all uh, unique um, file names. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a directory called uh, VMware drivers. And I'm going to take these, these raw paths. I'm going to pipe them to LS and then I'm going to copy them to VMware drivers. What? Oh, I got to do dash destination. All right. All right. So we got them all in one consistent location. Now, what I'm about to describe is a personal uh, methodology that I use when I'm building new policies. And I say this is like my specific way of doing things because there is a built-in switch in new CI policy where you can supply dash audit. And this will go through the code integrity event log and build a policy for you based on those events. I don't trust that. And well, what, what I don't like about it is that I don't have control over the specific events that I want to build a policy from. In this case, uh, I only want to build a policy from VMware drivers. And it's almost always realistically going to be the case that you're going to have um, your target um, events that you want to build a policy for intermingled with other garbage uh, events that you either don't want to allow or you uh, want to address separately in a different policy. I like for my supplemental policies to be as small and specific as possible because that lends itself better to auditability and maintainability. Like I can throw all my separate policies uh, into a GitHub repo and they're all tracked accordingly. And instead of having one massive uh, single merged policy, that just doesn't really lend itself to um, being able to, to be audited really well. I'm trying to think of the term, uh, you used Casey on this, um, like not, not like policy rot. You, you probably know what I'm talking about. What was the term you used? Like when a, a policy just gets increasingly unmaintainable over time. <clears throat> if, if you're still here, give a shout out if you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, that's why I said <laughs> sediment decay. Yeah, policy decay. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Cool, but drift, drift. Thank you, Lee. Someone was listening to uh, Casey and/or myself a while back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Casey did talk about that at uh, our troopers talk way back when. So yeah, policy drift. I, I really like that that term. <clears throat> so I copy um, only the relevant. Uh, files that I want to build a policy for into their own directory. Um, and then I build a policy off that. So, and my workflow for doing this is I call a horribly named commandlet called, um, one sec, uh, let's see, signer info equals called get system driver. Get system driver 
is a built-in commandlet that obtains very detailed signer information for a file for any um, file that can be signed. So it's not specific to just drivers and it's not specific to just system or built-in inbox code. Is anything that can be signed, this can get it. So it's just, it's very poorly named, um, but you just have to get over that. So I'm gonna supply a scan path. So what do I want this to pull signer information for? My VMware drivers. Um, I don't want it to uh, consider user mode PEs. These are just device drivers, so I don't need that. I don't need it to consider uh, script code. And lastly, by default, this will create a shadow copy. So in the case where like you're trying to build a policy off like say a device driver or a system file that's locked. So you wouldn't be able to get a read handle on it. It will create a shadow copy and use the shadow copy version of the files to create a policy um, so that you don't have those issues. Um, because I copied these successively to my own directory, I don't I don't need to be creating a, a shadow copy just for that. <clears throat> so this will take a second. It's going through parsing the embedded authentic code information, seeing if there's a catalog signature for any of these. Um, if you're not familiar, catalog signature is, it's a signature that's not embedded in the file itself. Instead, it's in the catalog directory in C Windows System32 cat root. Um, there's a bunch of cat.cat files in there and Basically, these are a list of hashes, and that list, that .cat file, is signed. So those are catalog files. It's a way to uh, um, separate a signature from the, from the file. All right, so what do these objects look like? Um, you know, you, you get some relevant signer and file information here. Um, I find the signer information is a little too... Um, uh, wordy and like difficult to follow. Um, so I generally don't like look at, at this output too much and I just usually trust that it works. Um, so then what you do with what you just saved here is the following. I'm gonna create a new XML policy based on that signer information. So new CI, CI policy, and we're gonna give it a file path. This is uh, the XML policy path. So we'll call this uh, VMware.XML and driver files. Again, this is really horribly named um, because get system driver returns signer information for any signable file. Um, presumably this was built a long time ago where they were just considering um, like drivers at the time. I, I don't know, that's, that's speculation. So I give it that signer information now, um, here's where some of the, the art of, of uh, trust and application control comes into play. So the level, the signing level. Um, these are all documented uh, pretty well in Microsoft. So these are, this is where you specify the type of allow or deny rule that you want to have for your uh, respective policy. Um, one of my favorite ones is file publisher. Um, well, more specifically, because we're talking about driver code, is Wickle file publisher. So this would state that of the uh, files that you're supplying via the the output of get system driver, each, in this case, device driver is one Wickle signed, and um, uh, the rule will be based on the issuing certificate um, with a specific subject name for the uh, for the actual code certificate. So what does this mean? This, this means that you're creating a rule based on the signing certificate, but the hash that you're using to specify the, cer the certificate in the rule is the intermediate certificate. So what does this buy you? Um, let me show you. I mean, all right, kernel 32, 
Let's look at its uh, signature here. All right, view certificate. So this is valid from <clears throat> 2019 to 2020. All right, so one year. Uh, what would be a pain would be um, to go through the effort of building these policies only to have a year later or, well, realistically shorter than a year because signing times are going to be staggered throughout the year, right? Where all these rules are just going to become invalidated, right? <clears throat> so instead, what you do is you uh, build your rule based on the issuer. So the issuer in this case is the production PCA certificate. And let's look at its validity period, 2011 to 2026. All right, I can, I can work with that. All right, I'm not gonna be around to care maybe in 2026. <laughs> uh, it's gonna be someone else's job to, to maintain the, the enterprise application control policies. So, so um, that's the benefit to using uh, the publisher rule. Um, the file component of it is, it, it will state that it must be signed by this publisher and it has to have a specific, by default, original file name. All right. So let me show you what this looks like after I build it. I think this is all I need for it. All right. Um, in some cases, well, actually in many cases, uh, you'll get an error um, because you've specified a level that is impossible <clears throat> to apply. I'll show, you, I'll show you what I mean by that in a second here. So let's look at our VMware policy. All right. So what do we have here? Here are specific file rules. Now these are not specific to a signer yet. Because I supplied Wiquel file publisher, it has to collect the file information. And so the way this works is uh, you're going to have a rule. So for every uh, file, assuming these attributes exist, um, the original file name, in this case, uh, VM, vm3dmp.sys, and a file version. So this is based on the current file version. So again, this assumes that in that version info embedded resource within the PE, that those two fields are populated. Again, original file name and file version. What's so cool about this is that assuming your uh, developers or whoever is responsible for the build process include that metadata, which they really should be doing, um, this will mitigate against rollback attacks. So let's say that, you know, one of these drivers in the future, uh, someone published a, a vulnerability for, right? Uh, obviously, well, like this is line of business required device drivers, all right? Otherwise we wouldn't be building a policy for it. Um, but what we want to prevent is when the patch comes out for say, in this case, VN or vsoc.sys, the one at the bottom there, that when they roll out the patch, let's say the next version is 9.9.0.0, right? We would update our policy to say minimum file version must be 9.9.0.0, and anything that precedes that is not allowed and will be logged accordingly. So that's how you would go about mitigating those, uh, those rollback attacks in the case where you have vulnerable code that you allow in your code integrity policy. That's why I love these file publisher rules. And also because I specified um, the Wiquel file publisher rule, here's that, uh, that EKU that was problematic for us before, that Windows hardware driver verification EKU. All right, so let's, let's start going down and looking at the, um, the, the signer rule, all right? So uh, what, what this states is that in order for a file to be allowed per this policy, it's um, the 
leaf or the the actual code signing certificate must have the Microsoft Windows third party component CA uh, 2012 certificate. It's intermediate certificate must have the following hash value and it must have the following OEM ID VMware okay and because we specified Wiquel file publisher it must be Wiquel signed it must have that EKU applied to it and because uh, when I ran new CI policy it returned successfully that makes me really happy because still to this day not every um, <clears throat> device driver uh, has gone through the the Wiquel, uh like cross signing process so it's a really good quality control and uh, the more drivers that opt into this um, the, the the better off you are all right um, so those must be true but we're not just going to allow any Wiquel signed VMware code to execute we're only going to allow the ones that we deem necessary for this host so the files that were specified here and again only the minimum version specified so from a code signing and software build policy perspective I'm really happy with VMware right now because all of their drivers are Wiquel cross-signed by Microsoft. They all have the um, their original file name specified, and they all have a product version specified. So I can build a policy based on that. When you don't have either of those set, it's uh, it, it it really bothers me because um, that there are going to be cases where you're going to have signed code that don't have those. Um, those attributes set in the version info resource so you have to make a decision do you either allow that signer in general so do you allow anything signed by that signer Google VMware whatever or on the flip side because you don't trust that you're gonna have to end up um, doing an allow rule by file hash and I'm I'm no fan of that I mean that that does not lend itself to maintainability right so that's two two poles of of the spectrum right there which is I, I find to be really annoying um, if only those attributes were there then you really have absolute flexibility over uh, and control over the the policy that that you want to build okay um, and so this is comprised in a single signer rule, this uh, signer W1 rule, which is then applied here in our uh, driver or uh, kernel mode code integrity uh, signing scenario. Now, in the interest of time, we're not going to cover, um, we're not going to cover doing supplemental and multiple policies. I'm just going to merge this into like my master driver policy. We'll reboot and then verify that um, these are no longer, that we no longer get the VMware audit events. So ha question from Sunny, how would you recommend we deal with internally developer line of business drivers? Uh, well, if they're internally developed, then my hope would be that they would be signed, um, that they would have the relevant version info um, in them. Now, the answer also depends. Like, if their line of business, if they're internally developed drivers, what process are you using to permit? Um, uh, what's uh, what's the the feature? Like what, what are you using to allow uh, like self-signed drivers to be loading, right? So you might be in a situation where you'd have to enable test signing mode on those hosts. I mean, that, that's a, de a decision that you know, you, you'd have to uh, come up with on, on, your, on your own if that's an acceptable risk. Now, the, the plus side of these uh, driver-specific application control policies is that um, test 
enabling test signing mode is a much more um, is a much less key, eh, less risky proposition because you're still under complete control of what is and is not allowed. The only difference is you're creating specific allow rules for drivers that happen to be uh, self-signed or like use like an internal like PKI certificate that isn't like attested or and like cross-signed by by Microsoft. All right. So that's my answer there. Test signing is uh, is reason it can be reasonable under this um, driver or kernel mode code integrity uh, application control scenario. Good question. All right, so let's wrap this up. Um, let's see. We have two policies. We have our VMware policy and the Windows default audit policy. Okay, um, I'm going to merge CI policy. Uh, and we're going to specify a new policy path. We'll call this merged.xml. Policy paths, you can give this an array of policies, uh, I, I believe. Now, the, um, the order that you supply these policies in is very important. And this is not documented anywhere, but let me explain this here in one second. Let me ensure this works. All right, cat, let's look at our merged policy. Do we have our VMware one in there? It looks like it probably is. Yeah, okay. All right, so the reason that the order in which you specify the policies is important is because um, we're not uh, mer merging um, CI, like code integrity policy rules, is the process of merging signer rules. But what about the file rules, like the file rule options here, right? What about those? Like, does one take precedent? Like, are we merging those? Like, the answer is no. Are we merging policy info and policy ID, base policy ID, HVCI or uh, hypervisor code integrity options? The answer is no. The answer is the first policy that you supply via policy pass for merge CI policy is the one that maintains the original rules, uh, settings, and all that stuff. So this is like, this kind of serves as the target into which signer rules are merged. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. And I want you to remember that if you get into the, the habit of merging policies together. Okay. All right, so we're going to deploy our merge policy. And I'm going to be so proud of myself if I reboot and everything works and we're right on time for uh, the end of this stream. Well, plus maybe two or three minutes. All right. YOLO. All right, so what I just did was I converted the merged XML policy to binary format, deployed it to the code integrity directory, rebooted, and upon reboot, I'm going to pull the event logs, the code integrity event logs, and if I no longer get those VMware events, then I did my job. Oh. That's good to know, Jeffrey. So, yeah, you can um, you can have an allow list for uh, com class IDs too, um, which is kind of cool. Um, I I can only imagine how many customers would actually uh, implement that, but like that capability is cool. So those are merged as well, uh, Jeffrey's saying. So thanks thanks for that.
All right, it's a race against the clock at this point. Colonel, since last policy refresh. Boom, all right, we're done. Let's call it a night. All right, I'm happy. So because I'm seeing no events surface, well, specifically kernel events, um, that tells me two things, that my um, default Windows policy is, like kernel mode policy is applied properly. Uh, and that my merged, like newly created merged VMware policy was created and merged uh, properly. So um, here, let's do this. Uh, SC, let's not forget about, oh yeah, sc.exe. Oh no, I need to do this elevated, I think. Um, let's start our um, uh, read write everything driver. Let's see, start, read, write, everything. This is the true test. All right, so we're running. I expected that because we're still in audit mode. Boom. All right, so that was not allowed per policy in audit mode. Um, I'm confident now that I've done my job thus far. So we so at this point um you know i you only live once and i got my, my wife isn't yelling at me yet to to come upstairs so here's what we're gonna do we are going to um sorry one sec okay No, it was uh, merged. I forget who was saying it earlier, but the the safe thing to do when going uh, into enforcement mode. Yeah, Sonny, there's going to be a part two for this. I, I want to continue this. It may not be in the next stream. I want to like try to mix things up a little bit. Um, but yes, uh, to be continued, we're definitely going to keep covering uh, Defender application control. All right, let's remove audit mode. And you know what? I am so confident in my work that we are not going to uh, default to audit mode if a driver fails to load. I am just that darn confident. All right. Because what I want to see is that um, that read, write, everything driver fail to load. All right, so let's do this again. Yes, Sonny, I have two thumbs and I'm playing with fire. Mmm, and we are booted. Yes. <clears throat> I hate that I have to do this to fix that like terminal bug. All right. Now I would expect this to not return anything. And then let's do start elevated terminal. Hell yeah. So read write everything failed to load. Um, let's pull events one more time. And notice, well, we got our event, but it went from audit to enforce. So this is gonna be a 3077 event in the code integrity event log for your reference. 
And uh, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good right now. So not only have I prevented read write everything from loading, I have prevented the Mimikatz driver from loading. Any conceivable driver um, that is loaded using traditional means cannot load. All right. So the only, um, well, the, the two evasions to this would be uh, because you're, because we're assuming that the attacker is able to load a driver, we have to assume that they're already elevated. Um, meaning because we're not signing our policy and um, it being enforced with um, virtualization based security, um, it's not going to be our policy is not going to be protected by uh, uh, UAFI. So an attacker can just disable um, or supply their own like allow all policy, right? So that's one vector. Um, there are mitigations for that, of course. We can sign our policy and um, uh, lock our policy into UAFI so that um, in order to update policy, we have to supply a signed updated policy and have um, to disable uh, defender application control, you would need physical access, right? Uh, and then the other would be to exploit one of the allowed uh, drivers. Um, but honestly, like, uh, like how much of our attack surface in doing just this in two hours of time uh, have, we, have we eliminated? So I think we've made some good strides here um, you know, and realistically, like, because I'm kind of familiar with this process, this wouldn't have taken a full two hours. This probably would have taken me without explaining everything in explicit detail for like a simple driver policy, um, maybe like not even 30 minutes. Um, so yeah. Uh, Lee, Lee's question, are you still using enforce CI policies on your machine? Um, Depends on what machine you're talking about. Uh, I do have a personal laptop that I have like a super strong uh, code integrity policy in enforcement mode on, um, and I'm monitoring that regularly. Like, uh, I'm I'm actually like such a geek. I, I recently got like a personal Microsoft E5 license, and I've got like Home Defender uh, ATP. <laughs> so I've got uh, like strong policies on like one of my personal laptops on my son's um uh surface and uh yeah i'm i'm like pulling back events and auditing those pretty pretty regularly because i'm like i'm a nerd like that with uh expendable income apparently so anyway um i think this is a good time to wrap things up are there any last minute questions before i sign off for the evening i don't know about you but i thought that was kind of fun not only because of our success in achieving our objective, but because we successfully worked through our failure in not seeing the VMware drivers pop up initially and working through that process with your generous help. So again, Casey, thanks for that pro tip there. Um, cool. Well, I don't see any questions, but um, I really enjoyed this. I was kind of worried that like I wouldn't have a good flow like looking back and forth between my screen and, and the chat like i feel like uh i i can do this so again i really appreciate your time like two hours of your evening is like no insignificant thing so um hope to to con continue this um again i'm gonna mix things up um i don't know for next week i'm, I'm not totally decided yet but i'm thinking maybe AMSI. I could cover that a little bit and like working, th working through my, my workflow of like how I use um, like AMC ETW events to do um, like script based, um, like deobfuscation and malware analysis. So that's kind of where I'm leaning now, but um, hit me up anytime if you have suggestions, like I'm not going to dictate what I'm doing every week. Um, I'm very much open to, to what you all would, would like to see um, within my abilities, obviously. So Anyway, I'm going to wrap things up. And again, thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed hanging out with you and, and interacting. So I will catch you later.